you are listening to the enhanced version of the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. Now, it's been a few weeks since we've done this, so let me walk you through, remind you exactly what that means. The enhanced version of the show has pictures. So, when you hear this noise, take a look at whatever you are using to listen to the show, because there's going to be some pictures or something to demonstrate what we are talking about. Enjoy this week's show, everybody. Here we go. Welcome to the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. I am Jeff Rubin, and today I am joined by Francesco Marcelliano, writer of Sally Forth. Welcome to the show, Francesco. Happy to be here. Sally Forth uh, is, of course, a nationally syndicated comic strip. How, how, I don't know how to measure syndication. How many markets or whatever is it in? Um... It's tough because why? Why start the sentence? I might have one number, and at the end of the sentence, it may be a completely different number. But I think it's in the seven hundred range as far as papers. It's 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 one of the big ones. It's one of yeah. It's 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 lasted for a while. It's been around for a while. And I met you through our mutual friend Oren, who used right. to direct college humor videos. He works at the Daily Show now. Uh, Fantastic guy. Amazing. Yeah. Really talented. Uh, and I met you, I guess, at his birthday party, maybe it was? It was his going away party, I think. I, it, oh, when he was leaving college. When he was, yeah, it was and, his last day, yeah. Uh, I, but I, I remember he introduced me to you and he said that you write Sally Forth. And I think I subjected you to like an offline Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin show. Because I, 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 I grew up reading you know, the comics page and I immediately there was just so many things I wanted to know about being a nationally syndicated comic strip. I think... This is going to be our second interview, but I'm going to record this one. Mostly syndication is just the loneliness, Jeff. No, it's... <laughs> that was a few years ago, so I, there may be some things I forgot. No problem. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Okay. How did you get involved with Sally Forth? Because you didn't create Sally Forth. I didn't. I don't mean to, I don't mean to like turn this on. You didn't create Sally Forth. You've what done are you doing nothing right? with your life. I'm sitting across a phony. No, um, I have been submitting strips for a while. Submitting, so submitting my own ideas. To, to who? To all the syndicates. Basically, that'd be King Features, that'd be United, Universal, Washington Post Writers Group. Can you take this back a step and sure. explain exactly how comic strip syndication works? Uh, on what end? I mean, on the syndicate's end or the person trying to get syndicated? Just the whole system. Like, who? Are, there's... All the there's only a few syndicators that do all the strips. Is that right? More or less, yeah. There's a handful. A couple of them have folded into one another. It's it's a small group now, but um, more or less how it goes is uh, on my end. I could say I submitted ideas for pff, like eight years, nothing. Occasionally I go, oh, that's not. You know, they say that's nice, that's good. The the strip I submitted that got me Sally Forth was in my head the final strip I was ever going to do. It was sort of like, this is it. I've had enough. And this is and how people, this is how new comics are bored. At one point, Jim Davis was just sending in Garfield. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, Larson basically had submitted his only proposal. He only had one sample. He lost it. He said, okay, that's it. And they called him up and he, you know, just happened to work. But yeah, so I had submitted a bunch of strips. It was the last one I submitted. And Jay Kennedy, who was the editor in chief at the time at King Features, he called up and he said, you know, is this Francesco Maris? He got it close. He, he had, got the last he had name. Trouble with the last name. Yeah, no, it's, it, it took me 15 years. But um, he said, Yeah, I said, We got your submission. I said, That's great. We're not going to syndicate it. And I thought, Oh, God, now he's bored. And he's just <laughs> calling people up. And I thought he was going to like laugh, like cackle, and slam the phone. Sucks to be you. Slam the phone. And that would be the end of that. But he said, we, We're looking for a new writer for Sally Forth. And, you know, we want to know if you want to do it. And before he actually finished the sentence, I think I actually just blurted out, I'd love to do it. And I think he realized the sheer level of desperation in my voice that he basically, do you, have you ever read Sally Forth? Like, I'm sure it's a good strip <laughs> because it never ran on Long Island. Comic seems, the, the comics page specifically in the newspaper seems so hard to break into because there's, what, like 30 guys who get to do it? There are, and then there are legacy strips, which I really can't complain, because in a manner of speaking, I'm doing a legacy strip. Mm -hmm. So I can't go, you know, why the hell's Blondie still there? Because someone could say the same thing about me. Are there new Blondies? There are new Blondies. Cause there, but there are some where they just, like, they do classic Peanuts, for instance. Well, Peanuts, there are no new strips. Part of his contract was no one else could write Peanuts. So once once he passed away, that was the end of new content. But Blondie, I think it's the grandson who does it. Uh, Beetle Belly, it's oh, the yeah. Sun. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of these are family oriented. Jim Davis has about eighty. P He's got like a million monk, an infinite number of monkeys just typing away Garfield jokes at this point. I don't think he even sees the strip anymore. But what happened to the guy that created Sally Forth? 
Is he, it a guy that created Sally Forth? It is Forth? a guy, yeah. Greg yes. Howard is the one who created Sally Forth, and he just walked away from it. And usually, I mean, with a comic strip, it's half ownership. You, the creator owns half, the syndicate owns half. And often when a writer doesn't want to do it, he'll just hire someone else out. He hired an artist in the early 90s, Craig McIntosh, who still draws a strip. But what he decided to do is that he didn't want anything to do with it. He's just like, I will sell you my half back. I want nothing to do with the strip again. It's almost like he was disappointed. He wasn't. It was sort of like, you know what? We've had a good run. Goodbye. How long did he do it for? He did it from 83 to 97, so about 14 years. I've, this is my 15th year of doing this. So when you got this job, how did you catch up on Sally Forth? I'm they, a little bit cheating. This is the one thing I remember from talking to you yeah, years ago. This they, really stood out in my mind. They sent me nine years of strips, nine full years just of strips. Just this huge, just thick this, binder. It was this huge box of just the comic strips. The printed history of Sally, Sally Forth. Forth. Yeah, and it, it was tough going. <laughs> But it, it was, you know, so I just read them all because so, I figured, you know, why not? Let's say someone is like you used to be. They were not, they're not familiar with Sally Forth. What is Sally Forth about? Sally Forth is the initial concept when it came out in 83. And it was a novel concept for comic strips. It was she's a working mom. She's a mother, but she also goes to the office, which in 1983, they might as well, in comic strip world, might as well append it with, and then she blasts off to Venus. Because as far <laughs> as the concept, it's like, that can't be done. I don't understand. How could she be at home and in an office? Is she clo- you know, she clones? But that's the initial concept. And it's kind of grown out from there because if that was still the concept, yeah, if there was still this anymore. novel idea, and then you, know, then you might as well trap the strip in amber and it's stuck in 1983. And but, you just write, and you I don't want to say you just write the strip. You write the strip. Craig still draws it. Craig still draws it. I write the strip, and then I write scene descriptions for what, each panel. What like kind of jokes does Sally Forth tell? Like what kind of humor is it? Um, what is it about at a grander level? <laughs> what does it really mean? What are you trying to say? Are you trying to say anything? Um, at this point, I think it's actually I just try to have the interaction between the characters. If I were trying to make it a statement strip, like this is a strip about home life or a working mom it would be the most boring piece of crap possible but it's just i've been writing the characters enough that to me it's actually just about the characters i don't try to do a punchline joke and i try to avoid jokes that are puns although some people can really do puns very well uh stephen pastis does you know pearls for swine but otherwise it's yeah it really is it's like i've got these people trapped in a little box let them just bounce off each other so you don't start. I was. This is one of my questions. Oh. You don't start with the punchline and work backwards. No. You kind of you have a setting, and you're like, "What would Sally say? What would her husband Ted say?" And then see where it goes. Right. From there. I mean, basically, I, I have an idea. It's like, okay, something's going to happen at the office, or Ted's going to lose his mind about something, or God knows what. And then I just think what the characters would say to one another. I often do this in the shower for four and a half hours, and then finally write it. But yeah, and it's just a matter of, yeah, no, I I think if I were writing for the punchline you would see it. It would be a very forced strip. I, I, don't, I don't like that kind. I'm, th- there are people who do it very well. It's just not the kind that I like to do. And you do five of these a week plus a Sunday? Do six a week and a Sunday. Do you, like, knock them all out on Monday and then take the rest of the week off? This, how, do, how does actually... So this is kind of what I'm interested in because it's it seems... Uh, you kind of alluded to this earlier. Maybe it was before we started recording, but it seems possibly like a, a lonely job. Well, no, I don't want to make it like it's, you know, I write this and then I go to my composition book, you know, books and write about you know, against technology and you know, <laughs> right, right. democracy is going to fail. No, um, but what it, it, how long do, how long does it t- does it really take four and a half hours every time or there's some that just click and some that you really have to beat out? Yeah, I mean, some just take forever and some I can basically write the week in under an hour. But, I, it's, but that would be like, scene to, you know, I write the dialogue first, and then I leave it behind, and I go back to the next day and look at it again and go, well, that's a mess, and try to clean it up, and then I write the scene descriptions. So what does the script that you submit to Craig look like? Uh, it basically looks, uh, it's, it'll say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You know, it, it's, just, it's just a Word doc, and then on each one it'll say scene. I'll describe the scene. Then I'll have the dialogue, S for Sally, and it's written in a special Sally Forth font that I have to use, mm-hmm. which... Even the script has to be in a specific font? Yeah, I mean, the scene description are, you know, the classic Courier new, you know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, the yeah, the dialogue is done just simply, you know, done in Sally Forth font because then he can lift it. It sort of looks like Comic Sans, but sure. we call it Sally Forth font because, you know, patent pending and all that. But, uh, but um, yeah, so I write that, and then there are three for each day, and then just write Monday through Saturday. So, I mean, on paper, it, it just looks like a little playlet. 
what is your work day like? Because I imagine this isn't a nine to five thing. Even and even stand up comedians, they have like shows at night. There's like some some time based thing that they have to be there for. But you could do this in the middle of the night. You could do it in the middle of the day. You could do it whenever you wanted to. Yeah, and that took a while to get used to. Yeah, because I've been working from an office, and suddenly it's like, okay, I'll do this full time. I have full schedule, and the result of that initially was that I ended up six weeks behind schedule mm -hmm. because there was no impetus. There was no like. Until, you know, the editor is like, oh, shit, I'm way behind. But uh, now it's just I know I've got to have Sundays to the artists about two months in advance. I've got to have weekdays about six weeks in advance. Usually I'm up to I mean, Sundays now I'm doing finishing up June. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting far ahead on that. The The weekdays I'm, I'm going into uh, March. Uh, no, April. But... Um, yeah, I mean, so that's the thing. I the the it's guilt. It's basically I got to get this to the artist in time so he has a chance. So it's guilt, and also if you are late, there will be financial penalties. Yeah, so you got you got to stay on top of it. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's guilt, and it's the fact that I want to pay bills. So it's like it's a combo platter. So do you like wake up, get right to work on it? No, I try to actually. I mean, well, I have other I have other work. I do copywriting. I write for some humor sites and such. And um, and for a while, I was writing a book. So that cleared everything off like a novel no it wasn't a no it's a <laughs> or, a, or a i mean it's was, a humor was, book was, was it a, comic based yeah, or it was was comic it prose it's prose but it's a humor book it actually it actually comes out this year so you know it, yeah that's my first book i ever wrote so hopefully you do a lot of other things you also have some daytime emmys i think according to your wikipedia page am i making that up uh, no, actually. That's a level of research. Not only did I, not only did I only read the Wikipedia page, I'm not even sure what I read on it. I'm sure there's a site called Wikipedia, and I think your name was on it, or it might have been Maraschino. I don't know, but no, it's um, yeah. I I wrote. I was a head writer for a puppet show, which sadly was actually one of my career goals as a kid. Basically, yeah, it was comic awesome. strip, puppet show. Uh, Jedi Jedi School, and that one's not going to happen anytime soon, mostly because of There's funding. There's a Jedi School in New York. That's a thing. We should get them on the show. This is I saw. Oh crap! Comic really? Guy. Yeah. Well, it's so like, now I know where I'm going to piss away my my money. It's like a gym. And you do like mock sword fighting, but there's also like a philosophical element to it where you like learn, you know, inner peace. Do they just like, kind of take the plot from like Jim Carter and add like a? It's, I, we saw them at Comic Con. I, I, we should, we should get in touch with those guys because they're doing something interesting too. But I don't think you get like actual light swords. I think you have to. You yeah, know, I have a feeling you a, won't be able to. It's a mock thing. Yeah, so that might not totally fulfill. So wait, I what did you close. want to be when you grew up? You wanted to do puppet stuff. You wanted to do comics. I wanted stuff? To, basically I wanted to be a cartoonist because I loved peanuts. So that was it. It's like I want to, you know, I love, I love Charlie Brown. I love Charles Schultz. I want, you know, I said this must be a great life. He must be the happiest person on earth. <laughs> I had no fucking clue about that guy's He's, life to any degree. I didn't know that. Did basically, you read that book about him? Yeah, I did actually. And uh, very, very sad life. Yeah, I mean, I knew beforehand. After a while, I knew reading it. And um, I think when you grow up and you look back on it, there's obviously a lot of sadness. Yeah, it's it's a somber it's, it's, it's strip. About loneliness. It's, I mean, yeah, it's about that crippling. image of like there's that Arrested Development where uh, mm -hmm. where George Michael, uh, you know. Whenever they want to show how George Michael's lonely and uh, sad, they like invoke Charlie Brown. Yeah, they had they had the little Trump right. just kind of mope along, and yeah, no, I mean, it, which is sadder because as a kid, I think I related to Charlie Brown just, I guess, more varied wardrobe and no, you know, premature alopecia. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's um, but no, that's that's what I wanted to do, and I have a feeling if I knew how hard it was to get into, and part of it I probably wouldn't have pursued it so there's a good there's a there's a positive side to going into something blind let me ask you sure. about peanuts cuz I don't know if you remember this going back to our fateful meeting a few years ago I said at the time I don't totally get peanuts as the best comic strip of all I think time. that's when I walked out and we never talked to each other <laughs> again I, I remember that there was something thrown it was it was a tragedy and I grew up uh, in the 80s primarily which was towards the end of peanuts lifespan right. like I missed the prime of it and uh, so I asked Joe, and they just started putting out these great Peanuts books yeah. of, uh, you know, from strip one, I don't know how far they're going, but they're basically putting they're going, They're doing the whole thing. Every, and so you get them by year. And I right. asked you, like, when is the prime of Peanuts? When, uh, um, what's like the, the era of Peanuts to get into? The 60s. The si Specifically mid-60s, I think, would be, he had a stronghold on the characters. That's actually when you saw more of the somber elements. I mean, that's why... Uh, the Halloween special and the Christmas special are from that period, and that was the sense of humor, and that was sort of the vibe he was going for at the time. 
Once you get in the 70s, it's fine, but then it starts to become, you see where it's more of a commercial enterprise mm. rather than a strip thing. And you could see where it's eventually going to its flesh beagle, Charlie Brown. I did buy one of the books. I forget what year it was. It's still on my phone. I'm sure I could look it up. I think it was maybe 63 to 64. That's a good time, actually. I, a... I, so I bought I bought the 63. Yeah. I have like a list of books to read on my phone. I added that one to it. It was This was years later, but now we're even further beyond that. So I, I, I got it and I read it. And I didn't totally, like, I still didn't see it as the best thing ever, but there were some that I read that just, like, devastated me. Like, every, you know, every, there's a few in that book where I was, that were really like, jumped out and really made me, like, think. Yeah, no, I mean, it was like anything else. It was going to be a series of hit and misses, but when he really scored, it was remarkable, and it was remarkable for that was a popular strip and it was doing very much the vibe it was the sadness that it would portray the uh crises that you know the emotional psychological crises in a minor level would do was not happening on any other strip it, you know, seems, it was like yeah. ali oop blondie i mean these were not characters who had any emotional crises or you know or or difficulty except for how am i going to get lunch or you know i'm going to be chased by the boss you know yeah it seems like one of those things uh where sometimes you hear about a great movie i'm trying to think of a good example of this uh, you know, Pulp Fiction is actually a pretty good example. I think a lot of people that watch Pulp Fiction now that have never seen it are like, what's the big deal with this movie? But when you saw it in the 90s, no one had done a lot of those things before. And there's a million examples besides Pulp Fiction. I think it might be the same thing with this, where when you see Peanuts now, there's tons, you know, you've seen a lot of things like Peanuts since then. But when everything else was Andy Cap and, uh, I don't know, maybe Andy Cap's good, actually. That was never my paper. But... Well, that was always the Simpsons line. Oh, Andy Cap, you wife beating <laughs> drunk. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, at the time, it was probably more revolutionary. It was. I mean, it really did stand out, right? I mean, a lot of the things that other comic ships do are inspired by it. So it does, it's one of those things, I mean, when, I'll put it, another, another example. Um, I was 10 when Star Wars came out. So that was mm-hmm. basically, okay, this is the Bible. This yeah. is it. This is the end all be all. This is the shit. There's nothing better. My brother was a few years younger. He's five years younger. And he liked it, but he didn't, he doesn't have the connection. You know, mm-hmm. I don't have that many because Lucas has pissed it all away. But um, so it really is, I think you're saying it, it, it's about being there at that moment. And I wasn't there in the 60s, mm-hmm. but as a kid, I was reading all the comic show from the 60s. I think you, it's just like, it's about, uh, and I heard Pete Holmes was talking about this once on his podcast, uh, getting it into your brain, like before you're, getting that stuff into your brain before your brain's like stops fully developing. Just like getting that sense of humor and that right. kind of, that really biting sarcasm and uh, satire and like getting that into your developing brain. And comic strips are a great way to do that. They're kind of a Trojan horse. That is, actually, that's a really, that's a really good way of explaining it. It really is a matter, it's almost like, Someone who comes from another country and wants to learn English, if they do it before age 10 or 11, they lose the accent. Right, right. It's very much, there's this period where it will actually seep in a little better in it'll work. And you enjoy, I mean. Especially in the 60s, like now, there's a million places you could get that cable, internet, whatever. Oh, yeah. But <clears throat> this podcast. But uh, <laughs> na- but in the 60s, like the com- like having a subversive comic strip, uh, you know. The- On a mainstream paper. Right. I mean, it wasn't like it was in the Village Voice. It wasn't like, you know, it's way off like in Screw Magazine or mm-hmm. something like that. I mean, it was in the, the, the paper record. And yeah, it, it stood out. And he did it in such a way using kids and using a very simple format that people were able to read it without thinking this strip is about this. They could see themselves in the characters and they can enjoy the strip, but they didn't read it as this is a statement strip. Right. Which I think goes to your point of like a Trojan horse. Mm-hmm. It managed to slip in. I mean, I loved Peanuts growing up and then other strips and you know, when I like the 80s, like Bloom County oh, and Far yeah, Side yeah. and, you know, Calvin and Calvin Hobbes. Hobbes. You know, those, 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 you know those, those are the crown jewels. Let me run my theory by you. Okay. Okay, because I feel like a lot of people are you Calvin and Hobbes versus Far Side. We're kind of peaking around the same time. I feel like that's a big... Yep. That's, I, my theory is that's the Rolling Stones versus the Beatles of the comic strip world. And the Far Side is the Rolling Stones where they're just like, lay, they're just like, rock, you know... They're doing old. They're doing jokes like just like kind of hitting it, doing it right. You know, just like playing, doing j- good s- jokes. I don't want to sound like simple jokes, but they're just they're just rocking. I don't know how to put this better right now. Whereas Calvin and Hobbes, like the Beatles, maybe a little more like I feel like there's a little more heart in it, a little more uh, s- s- a little more of that studio magic in there. I think no. I think that's really good. I mean, I think Far Side could be almost like a Rolling Stones hits collection. 
Okay. Because it is single, just single at bat, and you know, nailed it almost every single time. Whereas, uh, and this is using your analogy, uh, Calvin and Hobbes would almost be like one of the concept albums, the Beatles right. later. You know, like, I'm, think, I'm thinking later Beatles. Yeah, it's like we're going to do Rubber this- Soul, we're, we're going to move into Revolver, and then you know, slowly work into that kind of thing. I think I think that's actually a really good way of looking at this it. This theory has been in my mind, this has been in my brain for years, and this is like, I think, one of the only times I've ever said it out loud. And it's immediately, I'm like, oh, and you know the thing with the, I've been thinking about this for so long, and now I can't articulate. No, no, no. I think just, they're well, just like it was, and then Bloom County was Mungo Jerry, and I don't know what the hell that was about. <laughs> and County, someone I I was, was a, Credence. I think that was. You know. Well, Bloom County, I think I was a little young for, and I've looked back and I like them, and I liked some of them at the time, but it was never my favorite thing. Right. But whereas Calvin and Hobbes and The Far Side, I think whether you were kids or adults, and that's. God, I could never write a far side joke. I think if I sat down for a hundred years, I could never come up with a far side. It's something that he did so perfectly simple that for everyone else would basically you to retrofit that would take like fifteen years. What were you saying to, that he had one sample and he lost it? He I mean it's it's actually in one of his books, I think it's the prehistory of the far side, where he had like he was doing a comic strip in a local paper called Nature's Way. Mm-hmm. which was sort of a precursor. And he decided, you know what? I want to syndicate this strip. I want to bring syndicate. So he brought it to, I'm forgetting which syndicate it was. I believe it was in Washington, Washington State, Seattle. And he dropped off his samples. He said, yeah, you know, we'll call you one day. And then he left and he realized those were his samples. Oh, what so you do instead the only copy. Yeah, yeah. You, instead of printing and sending, you know, mm-hmm. blindfold, which I did for years and years, and most people do. And then it was like, oh, God, I'm screwed. So he kept calling them. Say, you know, has anyone looked? Has anyone looked? like, you have to understand, it's a blind submit, no one ever looks. And then when he called, he said, hold on, you know, can I pick up my strips? He was just like, that's it, I, I have to get my strips. Okay, I'll, let me go get it. And then she came back on the phone, the assistant and said, he wants to talk to you, the boss wants to talk to you. Because the far side, that's probably the best thing you could possibly blind pitch, because they take just a sec, you know, it's, you, it's you one see panel, it, yeah. the jokes are so good. I wonder which one... Which was which the one was the one that yeah because supposedly in the dialogue the guy came up and says this, you know is this Gary Larson yeah and he said you're a sick bastard and yeah it's like there's this pause it's like I love it we'd love to syndicate it but we're going to change it from uh, Nature's Way to the Far Side and you know Gary Larson's like I couldn't care if they named it Attack of the Zucchini People mm-hmm. and then he got home and he found the letter from the one paper he was submitting the strip to was canceling the strip so if he had waited another week he wouldn't have thought the strip was good enough and he wouldn't have tried to begin. That's so amazing. it's just a matter of timing and blind luck and, you know, that's what it, it's just a matter of just keep trying, I guess. And know. that's what you had to do by constantly submitting the strips. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I kept doing it and it was the last one and I submitted something that they liked the writing for and then uh, did the end. It took a while to get the vibe of that strip. What was hard about getting the vibe for the strip? It wasn't my sense of humor. So how did, you, not that, how did you adapt to that? Uh, well, the thing, and by saying that, I don't want to go, it wasn't my sense of humor. Oh, no, it was no, no, just, no, no. You know, It just, I didn't write that way. I mean, comic strips are produced by one, maybe two people. Right. So they've got a, a very distinct voice. It's not even like a TV show. Like, it's yeah. coming from this one person. So there's probably no strip that's your voice except the one you're doing. Yeah, no, I think, I think, that, I think that's a nice way of saying it. That sounds much nicer. But no, so it took a while because more or less I was trying to imitate the strip because that's what they want. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that makes perfect sense. And I sucked at it. I would say the first five years of my doing that strip were not good at all. It was just me trying. It's almost like a karaoke version of a comic strip. Five years is a long time. Five years is a long time. I mean, they, I guess they looked at it kinder. But if I look back on it, I would. there were some strips I liked and there were some ideas I liked. And then I started doing, after a while I started doing a web comic. And at that point, I was like, okay, I just want to do the jokes I can't do in Sally Forth. Mm-hmm. And then eventually I thought, Maybe I could put some of those jokes in Sally Forth. And at that point, either because they trusted me or out of complete exhaustion, they decided to stop editing. Because they would go through each script. For the first couple of years, they'd go through each script and say, here's what works, here's what doesn't. And at one point, they stopped doing that. I think because they just said they threw up their hands and said, oh, let it ride, whatever. And that's when uh, I started feeling more ownership of the strip. So you started that web strip is medium large. Medium right? large, right. Which is your online comic. So right. you started that out of frustration of trying to write Sally Forth's and trying to and having to adapt your voice? To a degree. I mean, I started it as an idea that I would eventually pitch it as its own strip. And I did, and it didn't get accepted, so I then I thought, changed it. I thought Medium Large was the thing you pitched that got you Sally Forth. No, I pitched some strip about a young couple 
just married because you know what the comic ships are really missing are young white couples. Uh, right, right. Yeah, they, they they don't have enough of well, young white couples and cats is and really what it's what's what's not missing. So that was because Sally Forth is also a serialized one with characters, which is right. as you were saying, like the jokes are all character based. It's all about setting up. The Hopefully, characters I'm, I know. hope. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas medium large is more from the far side school of like. Ran- I don't want randomness, like one offs. It's one offs, and it's a lot of pop culture, and it's a lot of because of who I, it's a lot of Gen X pop po- culture. But I started using that, and I started putting some of those things into the character of Ted. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, Ted likes pop culture and because Sally Forth, the husband character, was a husband character. He liked to golf, he liked to go bowling, he went to the office, he ate meatloaf. And because that's what the strip called for, there was no reason for it to be anything else. It was Sally Forth strip. But you write that for a while, and you go, if I led that life, I'd go insane. So Ted slowly went insane. He actually and went insane? He didn't. Well, no. For a year, he actually went to a deep depression. He actually did have a, uh, a deep depression that lasted. He lost his job. He was happy he lost his job. And then he couldn't find a job for an actual calendar year. And he actually lost his mind. He stopped shaving. He stopped showering sometimes. And the, the family was worried. But he lost it. But now he's come back where... Eventually, what I tried to do with Ted is I wanted Ted to sort of be like the father in Malcolm in the Middle. Mm-hmm. How? Very He's grown, like... very grown child, very love... excitable. Yeah. And I think now the probably the more up to date equivalent is the husband on Modern Family. Oh yeah, I never so, connected those two, but so, they are very yeah, I mean, similar. Like they're very goofy, eager, naive, happy, afraid to fail, maybe or like kind of yeah. like cowardly. Yeah, but there, there's but ultimately great. People. Ultimately, but there's this naivete and there's yeah. this still childlike aspect. And there's sometimes you go just just stop, just stop talking, just stop talking, just stop talking, and that's what Ted became. Ted more or less became me without a level of shyness. So Ted just won't shut up. So who are the characters in the strip? There's Sally. Sa- Sally is the main character. What? So we know she's a single working woman. She got to be strong. Yeah, she. Uh, yeah, or no, she, she's not single. She's, she's not single. I mean, I mean, well, I was gonna say, wait, did you read next week's strips? Uh, no, she. Um, yeah, no, she's married. She's a strong person. Uh, but actually, the whole thing is that uh, the initial concept for Sally Forth is that she was the perfect person, because the whole point is you can do this. You can have a family and you can have a job, which once again in 1983 is, and then you can have magic. You know, that mm-hmm. was a kind of, they didn't understand that. For that to be the case now, that's boring. And also, it's a little dull to write for a perfect character. So I would go online, and I had all these people who complained the hell, who hated the character. Because why is she so perfect? Why is she so perfect? Wait, where do you go online? Where are people talking about this? Uh, sadly, you just put in Sally Forth. And except for the fact that Sally Forth is also a phrase, you know, right. you, you, go, you can go Google for God knows how many pages. But no, it's Sally Forth basically breaks down. There are some people who really like it. it- there are some people who think this is the reason angels commit suicide, but uh, yeah. So she was a. Per- but there were people who say, "Why is she so perfect? Why is she so perfect?" So I tried to figure out why would she be so perfect. So I gave her a mom who was really problematic, a sister who demanded stuff, and I tried to show she had to be perfect because if she's not, she's going to lose her mind. Okay. So it was nice to show the cracks in her. So I, I have her where she thinks she knows what she's doing, but she doesn't all the time. Where is there an online Sally Forth forum where the fans get together and no, they're like, no, I don't Tuesday's th- strip was ridiculous. That's, Ted would never say that. I don't think there's specifically a Sally Forth forum because that 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 would be, probably be sad. Um, but what it is is that there's a site, Comics Curmudgeon. Josh, Josh, Josh Reed. Josh, Josh Foiling. Uh, Comics Curmudgeon is uh, Josh uh, Freilander's uh, site. I think the site's joshreads.com, right? It's joshreads.com. Right. But yeah, but it's co- the official thing is the Comics Curmudgeon. Right. I've, I, I've I actually did work. the banner, so that's that's, oh, really? that's his little sketch up there. He's he's a fantastic guy, and he's a really great. He's very funny and a great a great writer. He seems to be, as far as I know, the only person doing like analytical criticism, and they're funny to read too. Of the daily comic strips in the newspaper. He is, and it, what's great about it is that he clearly loves comic strips. Yeah, he's I mean, not someone who's attacking them because he thinks, oh, doesn't this just suck? Let's just make mm-hmm. fun of everything. And I met him online because he was making fun of Sally Forth, and I wrote to him, and I said, that's really funny. Mm-hmm. Because he, you have to be okay with that. Yeah, he does it in a way that's almost like, uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's this thing, uh, zero punctuation for video games, where it's like, He's picking on them, but it's out of love, and it's like very anal- like he knows what he's talking about. He's not just some shit talker. He's like it's very he he's very analytical and uh, very well versed in the medium. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's exactly right. I think with uh, with Josh, the what he does is what satire works best. Is it's always best to satirize something you actually love. Mm-hmm. 
because when you satirize something you don't care for, it becomes mean spirited. The humor gets yeah. curdled. It's it's not fun to read. Right. And there are people. The people who go to that site love comic strips, mm-hmm. and they love the comic strips that people would go. Probably in a lot of ways ironic. I go, why are you reading this? You know, they love Judge Parker. They love Apartment Three G. They love all the soap opera strips, where it's forty years later. And it's you know later that same day, and they, it, it's a place for them to go. He's really good. But there are other there are forums. There's uh, something awful forums where they have. Uh, oh, they do the comic strip. They do a comic strip thing and yeah they th- those guys are actually really great and uh they'll, they'll send they they'll actually send me strips that they've made fun of sally forth and i post them because they do a good job you know they sometimes come up with better punchlines i want to get back to the thing you were sure. saying about how you were putting medium large jokes into ted's mouth it seems like medium large and starting this web comic outside of sally forth was a turning point for you in getting a handle on sally it really did help because i felt a little more comfortable doing my own sense of humor in the strip so Ted became my way into the strip. I was trying to do it through Sally, and I couldn't exactly do that. So I basically said, okay, Ted's my avatar. I'm going to have me slowly go through Ted. And I've done it to the point that I've aged the characters about six years. I think they were in their mid-30s. They were like 36. Now they're about 42. So I wanted them to get closer to my age. So his reference points would, you know, because... Wow. Um, you know, I started doing Reference Point, and I actually, Pitchfork picked up one, which was weird, because I think I mentioned The National, or, because he was, a, or, you know, it was Ted going through his Cure album collection, mm-hmm. and someone on some site said, what would some 83-year-old woman know about The Cure? Why is she writing that in a comic strip? I was like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not 83. I, somehow I didn't argue the woman part. But, Isn't uh, it weird? And I asked this question, too, or I brought this up, too. Like, people just, I don't know why, assume that Sally Forth must be written by a woman. It would make sense because I think, you know, Kathy was written by a woman. That was the mm-hmm. other main but female. But Kathy's like, the point of view of Kathy is like particularly like female, you know? It's it's about being a woman for, I guess. It's more on its sleeve. It wears it more on its yeah. sleeve. And it does so because it, it was it was written by a woman. Uh, Sally Forth, yeah, I think, I think a lot of people either thought it was written by a woman or it's written by an 85-year-old guy and this is what he does between, you know, playing golf. And truthfully, that explains a lot of cartoonists. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I would I would actually go online more or less to say I'm not an elderly man. I'm not an elderly woman, and it's it's people's. It makes sense, you know. I, I can I can completely understand it. But it's um, the the fun thing after doing and going online was just to see what people thought. One of the strip, but two of what they thought of the cartoonist, or at least how it goes about. The other thing, I th- which is weird, that people go. What do you? Because I would write. Yeah, I write. So I'm in my apartment. It's like, what do you mean he's in an apartment? Doesn't he have a mansion? It's like I don't think you know the economics of comic strips. Yeah. Like, especially when you're the guy who takes over the writing thing. It isn't like. And now I have my helipad. Have you spoken to the original creator? I spoke to him once. Many years ago. The first time I got the job. Uh pleasant, pleasant conversation. He said, you know, good luck with everything. It really was like. Him more or less closing the door behind him, putting on the hat, getting his suit, and then just walking out. It's like, ah, oh, that was fun, and closing the door. So you've never gotten any feedback where he's like, I don't like this direction you're taking. Today. Um, I think initially once or twice he would send to a syndicate, and it would be, okay, you know, here's an idea, here's an idea. But he never was really hands-on. And initially with the syndicate, when I started doing the TED changes, I had my editor at the time. He called up and said, we need to talk. You're making the character TED insane. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I'm just doing what I, but that's what I would have done in that situation. He was like, yeah, I know, that's the problem. He can't be you. It sounds like you kind of evolved the storytelling a little bit in Sally Forth and uh, did things that it wasn't doing, because you have to to move it forward. You have to. I tried to make it, I tried, I added more characters, because when I started going online, there were people complaining about the strip, because they'll complain about everything. It's online, they'll complain about everything. And sometimes what they were saying was actually funny, so I decided, okay, I'll create a character who's basically them. So I made, I gave Hillary a friend, Faye, and Faye's initial job was she, all she did was make fun of the family. She was basically the person who was making fun of the strip inside the strip. Because mm-hmm. I thought, that's out there, why not use it? And it was actually fun to write. So basically I created a character to make fun of myself for what I was doing for half the time. And then eventually, like any other character, like on a TV show, the, the, uh, the sarcastic character softens and becomes part of the family. Right, right. You know how it is. You know? And like any TV show, whatever quirk gets larger and larger, like Cheers, you know, Clavin was you know, sort of nuts, and by the end of the series, he's a complete lunatic. You know, so mm-hmm. they just get more and more exaggerated, and that's how it works. 
I but think it's like they found. I mean, Cliff. They was find in, the voice with Cliff in particular. He wasn't even supposed to be a character. I think in uh, the. Yeah, he was a one off. He was like he wasn't in the opening credits. He wasn't anything. He was supposed to just show up once. So I, and once you see what uh, what's his name John Ratzenberger can do, you start to recognize right. his voice. And then over I don't know however long Cheers was on, and however long Sally Forth has been running, you just like figure out that what works, and then keep going. Yeah, that's what it is, and. Um, of course, now I hear John Ratzmer. Now in my mind's like, gee, I need to go see more Pixar films. Um, I didn't see Cars two. I, I couldn't I do saw Cars. Cars 2. How was it? Uh, bad, very bad. And I, as listeners will know, am I have like. A Wait a minute! Pixar. You actually mentioned Cars two. I think in a, in the oh, review you of the, 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 the Perry, the Nick. Perry by- yeah, yeah, exactly. He, he brought it up too, and I think I said then that I had brought it up before. I used to in- do like introductions, like where I'd like just talk about something for like three episodes before I realized I didn't have time to do that anymore. And, like, one is about Catan and one is about Cars 2. And I, I, I just, like, uh, I had a lot to say about uh, Cars 2. Because I'm, I'm something of a Pixar f- It's weird to say you're a Pixar fan. Because who ev- wouldn't be? Everyone's a Pixar fan. But I'm, that's like, like... I like eating. Yeah, but you I... You know, breathing, that's a good thing. I enjoy it. I have, like, a lot of Pixar... Like, if I... I'm, like, one... My apartment's, like, one Pixar piece of memorabilia away from being a six-year-old's bedroom, you know? Like, I got, like... You got some figures. There's a, some artwork. I, I have a lot of Pixar stuff. Well, that's fantastic. I, I, I have a what lot of robots. What were we talking about? <laughs> I have no, we're, no, we're just going to talk about Pixar. It's uh, Cars, I did actually see. Cars was basically Doc Holliday. Yes, very much so. I don't Doc Hollywood. Doc, Doc Hollywood. Hollywood. Doc Hollywood. With, uh, Michael, yeah. J. Fox. Michael J. Fox. Car, people don't like Cars 1 very much. I think Cars 1, ki- I think it's pretty good. I don't think it's... I think it's, it's okay. It's probably one of the, two, the, one of the two worst pre Cars 2 Pixar movies. What would be the other one? Uh, Bugs Life, which I also like. I like a Bugs Life a Bugs lot, Bugs Life too. is fine. Bugs I, Life I like is a... Those, Bugs... I like both those movies oh, yeah. a lot, but I think they're not like up to the... Uh, you know, I think uh, Ratatouille and WALL-E right. and all the Toy Stories and right. Incredibles are just on this completely other level. I have a lot of WALL-E stuff. Oh, I have a lot of cool. robot stuff to begin with, so yeah, I have uh, yeah, I have a lot of WALL-E stuff. But no, um, yeah, Bugs Life would basically be what the sophomore slump would be for Pixar. Which mm-hmm. would be great for anyone else. Their new one, Brave, which is something we have not talked about on the show yet, looks uh, awesome. That looks fantastic. I, I mean, saw the preview before the Muppet movie, and so did I. Yeah. The, the girl, the main character, has this like really long, flowing red hair, and I. So the preview played, and it's like really curly and messy. It seems like it's something you haven't seen done in computer animation. Right. It seems really hard to do. And as soon as the trailer ended, I heard this four-year-old girl be like, I like her hair. And I just, I, I wish I could show, like, the 50 PhDs who worked on, like, the rendering and the The algorithms hair. that went into this. So much work went into this four-year-old being like, I like her hair. But you know, that's what they were shooting for. Totally. Actually, I, it, was, it, was, it was exactly, it was very deliberate. It was exactly what yeah, they wanted. I'm sure if they heard that, it would cut to the scene like at Apollo 13 where they're yeah, all like cheering and standing up. Yes, yeah, yeah, they're all it. guys with the glasses and the short sleeve and so they're all celebrating. I'm optimistic about the future of Pixar, which is something I said even before I think that Brave trailer came out. I think Cars 2 may be a, a different. I think that's an anomaly more. Than, I think it's just John Lasseter going, I like Cars a lot. I'm going to keep, that, that's his baby and such. But no, what happened is Muppet movie, there was a kid, uh, so you saw, when it looks like all else, all has failed in the sure. movie, of course. And one little girl just started screaming, no! <laughs> no! Mom's like, it's going to be okay. This is, no! This is her she first was, movie. She doesn't understand how she movies She was standing work up and yelling at, it's almost like an old man looking at the TV. How could you say there are going to be new taxes? You know, just like screaming. And, just, and it was adorable, but... All right, I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm pretty anal about spoilers. I'm trying to be thoughtful about them, so if you haven't seen The Muppets yet, you might want to skip ahead about four minutes. The Muppets, of course, being the newer Muppet movie with Jason Segel. I know we already heard that there's a moment where all is lost. It's only slightly spoilery, more spoilery than that, but uh, there are some specific plot details, so if you want to go into The Muppets really knowing nothing and... There's no plot twist to the Muppets. This isn't very serious. But if you want to go in knowing nothing, you should skip ahead about four minutes, and then we'll get back to comics. And I'll give you just a little bit more time to take out your iPod, maybe figure out how to skip ahead four minutes. I know it's a pain. I'm sorry. Okay, last chance. Back to the show. Did you like the Muppet movie? Well, let's, let's, I want to give this a few more minutes of the sidetrack, and then we're going to get back to the comics. I did like the Muppet movie. I, You know, it is it... Is it the original Muppet movie? Is it that level? It, they tried as hard as they could. They tried. It, it, it wasn't. Time. And it wasn't the great Muppet caper. Both yeah. those are very good. After that, it starts to go, <laughs> Muppets take uh, Manhattan sure. are... The Christmas Carol one people Christmas like. Christmas Carol's but, good. I, mean, I like that. You can't really go wrong doing a Christmas Carol. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, there's a lot of precedent. I didn't like the new Muppets. As, I was a little surprised how much every, the rapturous response that it received. Because I felt like... 
First of all, I liked it. I enjoyed the movie. It's oh, yeah. obviously quite good. I thought the music from uh, Brett from Father the Conqueror right. was great. Uh, I, I, there was, I, I liked it a lot, but I felt like it, it, it s- traded a little too heavily on nostalgia. Like, the two best scenes from the movie are probably when they, for me anyway, and I think for a lot of people, were when they redid the Muppet Show theme song, and the, the, the big emotional climax... I guess spoiler alert is when they do Rainbow Connection, right? Which is not like that's only has the power it does because there was this other thing twenty five years ago that we all remember and love, and I don't know that it made a strong enough. Like I don't know what they do for Muppet Movie Two now because so much of it was just like, well, up its own ass, frankly. Well, yeah, I mean this this new Muppet Movie and well, obviously which the Muppets always were to a degree like the right. classic Muppet movies like about making. Uh, the Muppet. Yeah, movie. I mean they always broke the fourth wall continuously. No, but you're right. I, I mean you. I went to that film almost pre-loving it. Yeah, yeah, me I mean, too. Because you, you know, and I think that's what carried me through. You know, if I look back, it's like, okay, that was a little bit weak on the scripts, and a lot of emotional things were just sort of because. I think you're right. The, the buttons were already there. You yeah. you could fill in spaces that they didn't do in the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sad that they're not together. Why? Because I loved them before. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. They didn't exactly explain why it was sad within their world. But you know, you it was sad, you know. But it was you. You brought a lot to that film. The Muppet, it was still an enjoyable film. Of course, I liked yeah. it. I can't stress enough that I liked it. But I was just really surprised because it has like a hundred percent around. Everyone like loved it. I think oh, it's it not a, perfect. It's not perfect. It, and it, I thought it was good, but not incredible. I thought it was pretty good. The climax <laughs> of the movie with Walter. Walter's the new Muppet, and they have some weird rules with Muppets. Like, how is Walter a Muppet that isn't? How are there Muppets that are not already familiar? curb it like where do they come from that's a that's another thing yeah i mean that may be more the cabbage patch rule they just showed up one day so the climax of the movie and i guess again this is a spoiler but uh they need one last act for whatever reason and they don't they're out of acts and walter who's always wanted to be a muppet but he wasn't a muppet and he shows up and he whistles for a minute and i was like what just happened was that set up earlier in the movie why is it and like every, so he whistles for a minute, and everyone flips out, and it's so, it's terrible. It's, well, what happened? It, I, it's not, I don't say it's terrible. It's, I was just like, I, I was not moved by the minute whistle solo. Well, what it was, you could almost see at that point where they have all the index cards on the wall, and they're like, how about this idea? Yeah, put it there and that there. No, I mean because there was no build up to that. There was no build up to him trying to get a talent. There was no build up to him asp- except meeting the Muppets. He wanted to be a he, part of the Muppets. He wanted to be a part of Muppet, but they could have made it a little more. So the whistling thing, maybe you'd see him whistling by himself when he was at home or something. Or, you know, it's just I mean those are like the standard things. But no, I agree. And anyone who's who's now listening to this and thinking, why does he hate the Muppet movie so much? He doesn't. He's really coming across very. Uh, Jeff is coming across extremely Thank animated you. as he's describing this. I like so. The- He's, movie. he's I'm not so, going. I'm glad the Muppets are back and being taken yeah. seriously after. Fozzie, of- Fozzie is not lynched on something over here. Yeah. He loves the movie. He just I had sees res- its problems. I had with some it. reservations right. that I was surprised. I was frustrated that I'm trying to help you with the inevitable backlash. Thank you. With the people, it's like you know. <laughs> All right, let's let's bring let's bring it back, it back to-, to whatever that strip is. Okay. So Mary Worth. <laughs> so you do. Here's something I want to ask you. You do. Uh, you do Sally Forth, which is uh, these. This ongoing story. Right. You do medium large, which is random jokes that could be about whatever, and you never have to hear from them again. Is, right. Would you find one easier than the other, or one harder than the other? It actually, medium large could be easier because it is just like, oh, that's a funny idea, and also, it's like this I'll find funny. Sally Forth, I have to think what will work in a paper or what. Mm-hmm. You know, medium large, I can make a joke that if I put in the paper, like, yeah, we're yanking the strip for the day. So. In a way, it's just a lot more freedom. The Do you problem mean is, in, in the joke being dirty, or just the joke not being something that like is just not very broad. In one, it wouldn't be broad. Too sometimes it would be dirty. You know, sometimes it would just. Sometimes they're just pure geek jokes. You mm-hmm. know, which I try to make Ted do, but I try to put in a larger context. I had one where I think Ted made an analogy to like a Lars von Trier film, but it wasn't the punchline. He threw it in the middle of the dialogue, so if you didn't know what the hell that was, hopefully the joke still worked. But with Sally Forth, it is very much, okay, I can't pretend. The problem is when you look online and they're the people who like the strip and the other one comment, you have to keep remembering they're not the entire reading audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I work on the internet. I def- I'm yeah. familiar with this lesson. Yeah, you know, so you have to know that the people who are commenting are basically the, the small amount of people. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, that can that can make it a little tougher. But Sally Forth, on the other hand, if I get one idea for a storyline that I think could last three weeks, I can make the jokes come very quickly from that. So a lot of times with Sally Forth is, 
what's the concept? And once I have the concept, then I basically have them kind of bounce off each other and hopefully that'll work. And and I think recently I had one where it's like, what if they never met? So I got to do an alternate timeline oh, thing. which was that. And that was fun because it's like, you know what? Now we're just going to, it's almost like a Simpsons Halloween episode. Right, right, right. It, it takes place in its own little world. It doesn't have anything to do. Come back. and. It seems like maybe, I'm speculating, but you doing, I don't know if one is necessarily harder or easier than the other, but it seems like from what I'm hearing that doing both at the same time has made both easier for you because you have a place to put all of your jokes in one form or another. I think, yeah, I think it really does help. I think they help inform each other, hopefully. And no, it's it it does make it a lot easier for me. And um, I mean, the one thing is because there was some people, I don't do one because it's fun and the other because it's money. I mean, that's not the guy. I love doing Sally Forth. I, I wouldn't walk away from it until they basically say, you're ruining it, stop. But uh, I love doing the strip. I do feel ownership of the strip now, and that took me a long time. Yeah. I mean, it took me longer than the five years of where I thought it sucked. It's just like, I really love doing the strip, but I feel like it was a foster home. And now I feel like, okay, I've adopted these characters. This is my family, which now makes me sound even lonelier than the comment before about how long. These are my, this is my family. <laughs> these are the people I talk to at night. They keep me warm. Do you have like? Do you hear Sally and Ted talking in your head? Like, oh, I mean, not when I'm asleep day. or just walking, wandering around, and so you know. But um, yeah, I mean, Ted, I hear more because Ted basically is me. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ted, Ted is easy, and that's the other thing. I have We're to make sure. Ted right now. Hmm? We're hearing Ted right oh, now. Oh, yeah, this is more or less Ted. This is Ted sadly sounding a little like Ray Romano, but otherwise it's Ted. But no, it's um, yeah, Ted is for me very easy to write for to the point that it's a little dangerous. Because there are times where the strip does become the Ted Fourth show. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you know when uh, the break, you know, the sidekick character on a TV show starts to get center stage. Right, and, like you know, Fonzie. it's the Fonzie, it's the Fonzie. Uh, epi you know, I'm not saying to that level, but you know, it. But yeah, so I occasionally have to pull that back, and that's actually the tougher part. Remembering, oh wait, it's called Sally Fourth, but it's fun. I mean, I, I really do enjoy it very much. We kind of mentioned the internet just a moment ago. I want to talk about the internet a little more because I, it seems like it must be affected. There's so many comics on the internet now. If you were coming up today, would you still have to submit uh, to King's Features just over and over hoping for the best? Or is a viable path these days like making a name for yourself on the internet and going about that way? Um, truthfully, I mean, both options would, would, be, would be good options. I think... I would choose the internet only because it would give you time to develop the strip, mm -hmm. and it would give you a scent. It would give you a reason to develop the strip because you have an audience. I mean, the problem with creating a comic strip that you want to submit, at least when I was doing it, it was a very solid. It was basically no one else is looking at this except me and the friends that I show it to, mm -hmm. and there wasn't any expectation of the next day strip. I think if you do it online now, you build the concept that you have to do the strip regularly. And I, if I were it's trying to like shooting a pilot. And just like being like, all right, I hope this is good, and sending it out versus doing a web series. Exactly, and I think that's the thing. And I, if I were to try to do another strip now, or if someone who's trying to do it, I would strongly suggest. I mean, hell, it's free. You know, it just develop the strip for a couple months, get some feedback, get some audience. You don't have to make it a massive strip, and it doesn't have to be the strip that everyone hears about, and that's the reason they pick it up. But I would do it because you will have a sense of what to do. Because otherwise, you're creating twelve, eighteen, twenty-four strips. And it could work, but I think that would give you a better sense of writing in the art. I think you'll have a stronger sense of what the characters look like, what they sound like. I think, and I'm not a comic artist, but uh, a cartoonist, but anyone who is interested in creating a comic, if they're not willing to do it for free online just to hone their skill, like they probably shouldn't be submitting to King's Features anyway. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's listening to this and is thinking, you know, how do I become rich and famous as a cartoonist, stop right there. Mm -hmm. It's not going <laughs> yeah. to, that, that's not going to happen. It was rare when it, when it was the heyday. It's rare. If you're going into this, you know, it's like, you know, what would you give career advice for a cartoonist? Like, I think the auto industry is hiring. You know, it's it's not for the money. So it would have to be strictly out of the love for it. And because that's what you have to do. You can't think of not doing it. And if you can't think of not doing it, that's what you have to do. Do it now. Put it online. Build Build an audience, but also build your voice. I think that's the best way to do it. Where can people get medium large I, I think it's sally forth in the comic yeah medium in, large in is basically medium hyphen large.com okay and that is the one place where it is because i've made a big name with it no. mm -hmm. um i it's actually been in some college newspapers sometimes but that's the one place and i didn't update it for about a month and a half because i had jury duty that lasted forever in a day 
Mm-hmm. And now I don't have to do that for eight Do you years. find it hard sometimes to motivate yourself to do medium large because you're already, you know, producing a comic? Sometimes. Sometimes I try to. It, basically, every medium large is written that morning. Really? Which is why sometimes they'll go on in the afternoon. Yeah, it's interesting. But, I'm used to working up in, in the internet where, like, I mean, we did a video today that we posted this after, like, we had the idea this morning, we posted it this afternoon. So it's it's cool to hear that you can do that with medium large and have that instant satisfaction. Where Sally Forth, when you're like, the Sunday one's got to be done. What did you say, six six weeks in advance? Sundays are done two to three months in advance because you have to allow for color processing. I mean, but the, that feels so antiquated. Like, the idea that, like, you have to wait for the color feels... It's uh, almost like, you know, okay, we need an A, put that there. It's almost like you're doing the little printing press, and then do, you're going to run are off. Are they or, drawn in, in on a computer, or is it still pen and paper? Uh, pen and paper, you scan, then you color on computer. Uh, my friend but Dan. There's other. I ask because, like, I believe Penny Arcade, uh, our cartoonist here, Caldwell and Owen, right. who do the comics for College Humor and Dorkley, and are amazing. You should check out their work if you haven't seen it. I do uh, want to see that. Thank you. They, uh, you know, they draw on a tablet or yeah, on you the could computer draw a ta- itself yeah. on a, what do you call it? A Wacom? Not Wake- Wacom. Wacom. Wack- Wacom. Wack- Wacom. There's the tablet. Waco. No, that's Texas. Uh, uh. But there's also like the screen where the screen is basically like a piece of paper, you know, like a. I don't know, an easel, and you're like right. drawing right on the screen too. Well, that's why my friend, you know, uh, Dan Peraro, his he has a giant computer screen that he just draws on, mm-hmm. and you know he could change the text size, he can change what, and it's it's a beautiful piece of machinery that I can't even begin to afford. So you still but draw with? I draw, I light. draw on Lightbox, Rapidograph, scan it, and then any coloring or any shading. Lightbox is not software; that's an actual Lightbox. Lightbox is. There's a box with a light bulb inside that I'm plugging in. Yeah, it, it basically is as old school as possible. It's it's how I enjoy doing it. If it's more, I'd like to eventually try to draw on a tablet, but this is what I've been doing since I was five. I think whatever is the be- whatever whatever works whatever gets the idea out of yeah. you in the most natural way is. Fine. I don't think the digital is better or worse or whatever. But. Right. No. It's but I'm just just to bring back before what you're saying about the time length for a Sunday strip. I actually experience what hell that could actually lead to this is about several this is early 2000 like 2002 2003 i did this sunday strip and it was just sally having a dream and things were getting weirder and we're in a dream like people kept coming into the office and eventually in the it's mentioned in it that chechen rebels have broken into the office and they're coming up to think just for whatever so i would get i get the sundays like the black and white with the color separation it's about a month actually about three weeks before they come out this one i got late i got about two weeks what had happened is the day before I got that with the Chechen Rebel joke was the remember the news event when the Chechen Rebels broke into the school? Kind of. Yeah. Well, they, there was a news I event. read the New York Times. I, so, so. Yeah. All right. So no, but the, what happened, and this is sad the way this goes, but there was a the Chechen Rebels broke into school and shot 86 kids. And then the next day I get the thing where I have my joke about the Chechen Rebels. Oh. And I'm like, I'm fucked. Mm-hmm. So I called the newspaper and I said, I called my editor and said, we have to yank the strip. So we can't yank the strip. These things are done way in advance. Well, can we just replace it with like a black box or an old strip? It's like, no, they're already on their way. You can't do anything about it. I said, well, what can I do? Can I write a letter that the newspapers can run saying this strip was done prior to this? Because otherwise, it just looked like the most inhumane Yeah, comment. I think most people don't appreciate that those take two to three months to do. Right. I mean, they would assume like, oh, God, was he actually inspired by yesterday's news event? You know, so it's like, oh, crap. So I wrote this. It ran in all the newspapers or these newspapers around. And I sat going... I'm screwed, I'm screwed, I'm screwed. I don't know what response I'm going to get. I got one letter. An actual letter, not an email. I open it up, and I see that, and I see the editorial that I've written fall out in this long handwritten letter on unlined paper in this manic scroll. It's like, oh, God, what is this? It's like, dear Mr. Macaloon. Didn't even come close. But it's like, <laughs> dear, but, you know, a temp would say, dear Mr. Macaloon, I saw this, I saw the, your editorial about about this strip, but that's not why I'm writing. I'm writing to demand that you give Sally, you Sally Forth bigger breasts. <laughs> Blondie has big breasts. The character from Zitz had big breasts. Why can't she have big breasts? I'm 84 years old. I like real women in my strips. Oh my Please God. write this. And then there was like a root somewhere in like hinterlands of West Virginia. And that's what it was. That I was the my, only response. I told response. my grandfather not to send that letter. <laughs> but that was the only response I ever got from that. I'm going, I am. So-. However, one day I actually misspelled one of the character names from Thundercats, I got 35 emails. Lionel? Shitara? Which one? Shitara. I got Shitara wrong. I think I added an extra H. And I got 30... I think it's based on Cheetah. Cheetah. They're all... Obviously, they're all cats. There's Lion, o Panther. Right. Now we're in my wheelhouse. This is something I know about. <laughs> I like, okay, now we're talking my game. <laughs> Chechen Rebels. Pff, but, you know, if we're talking Thundercats. But, uh, yeah, so I got... an angry letter about that. Oh, I got a bunch of angry letters. I got one where the cat was missing for a little while. In the strip time, it'd be two hours. 
in the strip to, for the story. It was two weeks, and all these people were demanding the strip be pulled. I got all PETA called me. Everything. I got a group that was from the Bat Preservation Society. I guess the thing about being in the newspaper uh, and having a syndicated comic is everyone's going to read it. You've got no idea. You have no, yeah, I mean, and once it's out there, it's their strip. Yeah. Whatever reaction they have to it is the right reaction. Right. Because, you know, it's not like, why aren't you laughing at that? Because it wasn't funny to them. Once it's out there, I don't own the strip anymore. That's cool that even today, everyone reads the comics page. You know, that, not, not, not every person, but right. all types of people. Uh, there's, there's no type of comic strip reader. Everyone's reading it. Well, that's it. I mean, but one, and this I actually found in a forum that someone had written, and I forgot what it was. I don't even know what the strip was, but someone wrote, if Francesco Marcel, and he spelled the name correctly, so I had to read the rest of it, doesn't shoot himself in the head soon, I'm going to New York and fucking shooting him for him. Mm -hmm. And that was followed up by the guy actually found my phone number and left it on a voicemail. Back when remember remember answering machines, um, the year was nineteen years. The year was two thousand and three, but it was sort of like, well, I don't think his mom's going to give him the bus fare to come up here, so I don't think this guy's going to leave his basement apartment. And maybe he's here and he's just bad aim. But uh, yeah, it was just this guy kept saying he wanted to kill me, and I don't know why because it's a comic strip, and that's weird. But yeah. that's that's minuscule. Basically, it's like, oh, that fucking sucks. It's like, oh, I, that I could deal with. But so many more have enjoyed it. I like to think there are less less death threats, I think, than, uh, yeah. I think it's working out. I'm alive. Medium-large.com. Anything else we can plug? Uh, I do have a book coming out uh, early fall, the humor book. Well, let with me know what's and I'll put it on uh, you know our Twitter and oh, Tumblr yeah. for everyone that's following the show. And if you don't know those, I'm going to plug them in a minute myself. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, please. This no, this is great. I'm glad we got to talk about Pixar. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and the Muppet movie. That's where that's where that's, the meat of the conversation really kicked in. Perfect. No. Uh, thanks again. Oh, please. Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much, as always, for listening to the show. Big episode coming up next week. For the first time on the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show, we are going to have Streeter Seidel, and we're going to be talking about Downton Abbey, motherfuckers! Woo! That will be out on Tuesday. I will remind you when it's out. I will remind you when Francesco's book is out. Only way to know, literally the only way to know, is to follow me on Twitter at Jeff Rubin Show. Uh, like me on Facebook at my Facebook fan page. Like me. And uh, Tumblr, JeffRubin, JeffRubin.com. And, of course, YouTube at YouTube.com slash JeffRubin, JeffRubin. Thank you guys so much. You're all beautiful. Uh, let's talk more next week. Bye.